So the title of this morning's talk, Getting the Most Out of Halloween, a provocative title and run rather different from the others in this service. We've had getting the most out of worship. We've had getting the most out of sermons, getting the most out of personal time with God, all hopefully very appropriate and I hope helpful. Getting the most out of service and getting the most out of giving, slightly more uncomfortable, but of course appropriate. But getting the most out of Halloween, how on earth can that be an appropriate title for a sermon? Now there will be some who will see it as inappropriate because they believe the church should have nothing to do with what they see as a rather horrible celebration of evil, especially one that's so influential upon our children. But then at the other extreme, there'll be some that, it will see, uh, that will see it as an inappropriate title for a sermon, because when it comes to things like Halloween, they believe the church simply needs to chill out and realize how daft it is, not to mention the PR disaster of putting a downer on a bit of harmless fun. Now, I won't ask for a hands up of where you stand in regard to those two positions this morning. I did think about doing that, getting people to put their hand up about which poll they came nearer to than the other. But it's important, like everything within our Christian life, that we're honest. And we're at least clear with ourselves about what our most natural response is to those two options. I might add that the ironic thing is when both ends of that spectrum collude in making sure that the subject of the church and Halloween isn't addressed. Nearly 20 years of living in New Morden has taught me that avoiding unpleasantness or disagreement is so important in our culture that that sort of unholy alliance quite often happens. But it is an appropriate subject to think about this morning. And that's because whatever its rights and wrongs, in fact precisely because of its rights and wrongs, Halloween provides us with an opportunity to engage with something that we normally avoid. Halloween provides us with an opportunity actually to engage with really serious stuff that I believe we ignore at our peril and which we will really benefit from having to confront. And this starts with us thinking a little bit about the roots and the development of Halloween. So the roots of Halloween, it might or might not surprise you to discover, are thoroughly Christian. And they lie within two Christian festivals that grew up during the Middle Ages. First, All Saints Day on the 1st of November, and then All Souls Day on the 2nd of November. And to understand what that was all about, we need to think a little bit more about the understanding that was around at the time. You see, the medieval church believed that there were three categories that existed within the church, within the body of Christian believers. So let's have this up there now. The medieval understanding of the church was that those Christians still living on earth, people like us, they were described as the church militant. Why were they described in that way? Well, they were the Christians who were still on earth struggling against the powers of evil within it, the church militant. But then there was another category called the church triumphant. What was the church triumphant? Well, that was understood as those Christians who'd led lives of such great holiness, of such great goodness, that they had gone straight to heaven after they died. These people were described as saints or hallows because of their holiness, and they included figures within the Bible like St. Mary, Jesus' mother, St. Peter, and St. John, the disciples, but also later figures who'd been canonized or declared to be saints by the church, people like St. Francis of Assisi, and St. Teresa, and so on. So that was the church triumphant, the saints who'd gone straight to heaven, according to this understanding. But those saints, they weren't too numerous, there weren't too many of them, meaning that a far larger number of deceased Christians comprised a third group, and that was known as the church expectant. Now, this was understood to be those Christians who'd done enough to avoid hell but not enough to go straight to heaven. 
And unlike the saints, unlike the church triumphant, these people were sent to a place called purgatory where the sins that they'd committed during their lifetime were being purged, hence the name purgatory. And when that process was finally complete, they could take their place in heaven. And you'll probably already know, particularly if you studied in history at school, the various practices developed in the Middle Ages to help people minimalise the time that they had to spend in purgatory. There were prayers that could be said for them, there were masses that could be offered for them, communion services, there were what were called chantry chapels and so on, and there was quite an industry for making sure that people's time in purgatory was reduced. And all of that may sound strange to us now, but all of that was the basis for All Saints' Day on the 1st of November, when the saints were remembered, the church triumphant was remembered, and All Souls' Day on the 2nd of November, when those in purgatory, the church expectant, were. And the night before all of this began, the 31st of October, became known as All Hallows' Eve, or Halloween. And various rituals sprung up and developed for Halloween, including people dressing in black to mourn those who died, and children calling on people's houses to receive soul cakes in return for praying for the dead. Now that's the practice that may anticipate trick-or-treating. That's all the historical background. Fast forward to modern times, and most of those original associations and the theology underlying them have now gone. Halloween is now seen as a largely light-hearted occasion, when we show that the things that might scare us, things like witches, ghosts and devils, don't need to because they're essentially harmless. And that's where all the costumes come in, with their comic scariness. And of course, Halloween is now very established. It's established enough to uh, have a key point in primetime television, doesn't it? It has a special week on Strictly Come Dancing. If you were watching Strictly last night, put your hand up if you're a Strictly watcher. You all have seen Craig dressed differently from that. This is a couple of years ago. And the other judges and all of the contestants very much embracing Halloween. Much of the growth in the popularity of Halloween over the last 30 years has been put down to the influence of America. And in many places within this country, Halloween is now pretty strongly established as an annual event around which, particularly for children, fun and community is found. Now, in places like Lewis in Sussex, where I spent eight months working for an organisation called Care Force in 1988, it's actually a lot more serious. There's a lot more ritual and there's a lot more connection with modern-day witchcraft, which is uh, quite strong in Sussex. But for most people in Britain today, Halloween is perceived to be about as harmless as having baddies within children's films like Frozen and Shrek. So recognising all of this is important, engaging with the roots of Halloween, engaging with the nature of it today. That's important, but it's also the easy bit. The more challenging part of getting the most out of Halloween is our response, isn't it? Partly to the historical roots, that is important to respond to that, but perhaps more importantly, responding to the role that Halloween plays in our society today. So I'll take the first of those initially. Responding to the roots of Halloween. And it's here that Halloween can remind us of the importance of a pretty key event in Christian history called the Reformation. And by a happy coincidence, and it is a coincidence, Halloween is the very same day, the 31st of October, as Reformation Day. The day when the church remembers that event and its importance. And the reason why it's on that particular day is because it was on the 31st of October 1517 that a German monk called Martin Luther made his famous challenge to the practice of indulgences. By reputedly, there's some debate about this, but by reputedly nailing his 95 theses or objections to indulgences on the church door at Wittenberg in Germany. Now, what were indulgences? Were well, indulgences were sums of money that people paid to the church 
in order to get time off purgatory. And the basis of this was quite interesting. The idea was that uh, the saints, those in the church triumphant, those who'd made their way straight to heaven, they had such a superabundance of merit or goodness or holiness that there was enough to be shared out. There was enough for them and a bit more left over as well. So the idea was that if you bought an indulgence, if you uh, paid a certain money to the church, then you could get a certain amount of this merit and you could reduce the time in purgatory either for you or one of your loved ones. Now, fundraising is an interesting challenge in church, so maybe we ought to do a bit of that. Do you think reintroducing indulgences would be a good way of getting our funds up? I don't think so, no. And Martin Luther certainly wouldn't have agreed with that, because Martin Luther, very courageously, because of the amount of money involved, meant that this was a huge risk he was taking. But Martin Luther proclaimed, very courageously, that it was totally wrong and inconsistent with the Bible Firstly, to believe in purgatory at all. That was completely unbiblical, he said. Secondly, to believe that there were certain Christians called saints who were qualitatively different from normal Christians. Martin Luther said all Christians are saints. They're all set apart from God, which is what the word saint means. And thirdly, and most importantly, Luther said it was totally wrong and unbiblical to understand people having to earn God's rescue earn God's salvation, either through their own holiness or through prayers and masses that were said for them or indulgences that were purchased for them. Purgatory didn't exist, it was all a complete mistake, and forgiveness and salvation, reformers like Martin Luther said, had nothing to do with the saints and what they had done and their merit and so on. It was entirely down to this. Forgiveness and salvation was entirely the result of God's grace with people simply needing to receive this gift through faith. Now, they're wonderful and important truths, aren't they? While the roots of Halloween and what it once met can now seem rather distant, it does nonetheless form a good opportunity for us reflecting on these roots and the amount of misunderstanding about God and how to reach God that they contained. One of the most important and unchanging truths about Christianity is that none of us can earn or purchase our way to God, can we? Because we're all sinners. And left to our own devices, we can do nothing about that. But an even greater truth is that the God of love who came in his Son, Jesus Christ, to live, die and rise again, came to do that so that we could be offered that totally free gift of God's grace and salvation. The grace that firstly forgives us and then transforms our life to give our lives significance and meaning and purpose as we live those lives for him. So that's part of the way that I believe we can get the most out of Halloween. Engaging with its roots, understanding what those roots were all about and thinking really clearly about how we should respond to all of that thinking, much of which which got it completely wrong. But perhaps more importantly is what I want to go on and speak about now. Responding to Halloween today. It would be over the top, I believe, to call Halloween, certainly in most places, a celebration of evil. I believe that would be over the top, to categorise it in that way. But a very strong case can be made for Halloween being something that trivialises evil and plays a role in us not taking the concept of evil seriously. See, the truth is that particularly in middle-class societies, evil is something that most of the time we prefer to tell ourselves doesn't really exist. The world does this and Christians can quite often go along with it more or less as well. See, compared to previous ages, we tend to put the problems of the world down to misfortune rather than malevolent causes, don't we? And we regard suggestions that something deeper is at work, we tend to regard that as rather superstitious. In our everyday lives, the concept of evil doesn't really tend to be engaged with. Until that is, terrible things suddenly occur. Until events happen like 9-11, or 7-7, those terrible terrorist attacks, 
All those dreadful murders of those two young girls in Soham a few years ago now. All those terrible murders by that doctor, Harold Shipman, who was killing those patients who trusted him. When those events happen, suddenly it's only the language of evil that seems appropriate to describe it. It's then that the concept of evil returns with full force. There are some headlines occurring after those events, and we see the word evil used in virtually every one of them. The language of evil suddenly becomes the most appropriate thing people think can describe what has happened. However, and this is the crucial point, because we're not used to thinking about evil in any depth, because it's not a concept that we're thinking about and reflecting about in normal time, when we suddenly have to engage with it, it's something that we quite often handle rather immaturely. Usually by thinking that evil is simply located within certain particularly wicked people and they simply need to be dealt with for order to be restored. We can do the same with terrorist events. When 9-11 happened and 7-7 and the shock of those events happened, we had people like Tony Blair saying, our task is now to rid the world of evil, as though that was something that could be simply accomplished. George Bush spoke about being up against an axis of evil with no understanding really that that evil might be more sophisticated than just simply located within some al-Qaeda terrorists. And sadly, as the war in Iraq has shown us, and I think most people would probably agree with this now, that sort of simplistic diagnosis and therefore simplistic response to evil generally leads to more harm than good. And Halloween, harshly assessed, colludes with this process of the trivialization of evil. Halloween, harshly assessed, certainly the way that most people approach it, encourages the idea that evil is an odd, superstitious thing that we and our children can and should laugh at because it doesn't really exist. Do I think that Halloween produces an unhealthy fascination with evil and leads our children closer into occult practices? Not really. Do I think that Halloween helps confuse both them and us about something that's really important? Almost certainly. So what is the answer? How do we respond to Halloween? It's happening all around us uh, tomorrow night. How do we respond? Well, probably not, in most cases, by simply having nothing to do with it. If we've got children or grandchildren, which a number of us have, then for them to miss out on the excitement that comes from dressing up and going out in the dark with their friends to trick or treat and get all of those sweets, it probably will be rather counterproductive. They won't particularly understand why we're not engaging with it. Now, I bought a big tub of sweets for the children that come to my door tomorrow night, and I've uh, bought a pumpkin. This afternoon, I'm going to try, with the help of Katie, to cut a cross into it, actually, to put a light into it, to be actually a Christian sign. But the sign will be to children in the local area to know that they're welcome, and I've told the children at 9.30 and their parents that they're free to call on me. And when they call, they'll see me like this. This will be a bit of a shock to you. When they call at my house, they'll see me dressed up, not as a witch, not as a wizard, not as a goblin, not as a devil. I will be dressed, well, that's my best attempt to be an angel. It's about the end time my surplus gets an outing these days, doesn't it? The blonde wig is there because, you know, you've got to have something on your head, haven't you? And my angel wings that Tom Collins made for his several years ago now. And I'll be giving those kids that come sweets to try and represent what? To try and represent God's love and God's light coming into their lives. Now, normally what I do is to drive around the houses of some of our children who come to the 9.30 service, but I'm still recovering from this op I had the week before last, and uh, for doctor's orders, uh, I've got to sort of stay in, so I've issued the invitation for people, people to come to me instead. So if you've got children or grandchildren who want the Halloween angel vicar of New Morden experience, you need to come to me this year. But it's one way, maybe a rather daft way, is just one way of trying to get this balance and avoid these extremes of total non-engagement and total collusion going along with it, no questions asked. What it's trying to do is to engage with the fun of Halloween, but with a subversive message, the message that God's love is more powerful and more attractive than all 
of the evil within the world. But a more important way, perhaps, of us getting the most out of Halloween is to refuse to allow it to be our only response to evil. To allow our only response to evil to be a trivial one. That's the real take home, I think, from this talk this morning. If our only engagement with evil is once a year at Halloween, that is completely insufficient. We need to be encouraged to engage with it far more as a meaningful concept. You might be wondering why we had that weird passage read to us from Revelation, very well read by Pamela, with all its talk of beasts and dragons and so on. What on earth is going on in that passage? Well, it's a passage that's using all of that bizarre and strange imagery to describe the evil within the Roman Empire. The evil within the Roman Empire that people at the time might otherwise have been completely blind to. See, the Roman Empire in the first century was full of spin and full of propaganda. Much like the equivalent empires today, like Amazon, Starbucks and Betfair and so on, they all try and make out that they're, to bring, they're to bring peace and blessing and prosperity to all. Impressive buildings and statues were placed everywhere throughout the Roman Empire to reinforce this. The fact that so many survive shows just how many of them there would have been at the time. But the writer of Revelation wants to unmask the reality behind the spin. The writer of Revelation uses this startling imagery of beasts, dragons, and prostitutes to unmask the reality behind the spin of Rome and the evil that, for instance, kept a majority in servitude and slavery in order to serve a rich elite. There was loads of spin, loads of slogans like Pax Romana that were meant to disguise that, and the writer of Revelation wants to expose this evil for what it really was. The Roman Empire had its own equivalents of Halloween to distract attention from this reality. It was said that the secret was bread and circuses, feed the people and give them entertainment, and they're fine. And in our era, we've got to make sure that a trivial depiction of evil doesn't distract our attention from what the reality of evil really looks like and all its horrible effects. Because those images up there now, that is more of the reality of evil, isn't it? The injustice that is present in this world, the oppression, the exploitation, and so on. That is the nature of the evil that we need to engage with, not its trivial alternative. So do Halloween and all its trappings if we must, but let's also open our eyes and those of our children in an age-appropriate way to the reality of evil in this world. Evil, not a few bad people doing a few bad things, but evil as a world that's badly out of kilter with the way that God made it to be, and lots of people suffering while a few live lives of comfort. Now that might sound a little bit negative, especially for our children, but it's not. Because once we acknowledge the reality of evil, and once we allow our children to acknowledge that reality, they and we can then have so much a deeper appreciation of the greater power of God's love. The truth is that fear of bad things is a big issue for our children. They can spend quite a lot of time fretting about the bad stuff within the world. It can really get to them more than adults sometimes realise. And rather than trying to prevent children from discovering that evil exists and just keep the whole thing at bay from them, it's much better to teach our children or our grandchildren, in an age-appropriate way, of course, that evil does exist and it does terrible damage, but that a greater power exists in God's love. And this is where our doctrine as Christians is so important, because this is what the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is all about. Evil doing its absolute worst, that's what put Jesus on the cross, but in the process being defeated by the greater power 
of God's love. And that is a massively attractive message for our children. Why is it an attractive message for our children and, of course, us as well? Because it acknowledges the reality of evil in this world and all the awful stuff that it does. It doesn't shy away from that. It fully acknowledges that evil exists, but it shows that it's not going to win. That the bad stuff, and that's perhaps a better way of putting it to our children rather than using the word evil, we can talk about the bad stuff in this world, which they will fully understand when we do. It's there, it exists, but it's not going to win. It's not going to win because a greater power exists in the power of God's love in Jesus. The power that defeated evil when it did its worst and put Jesus on the cross and the victory that was demonstrated through Jesus rising from the dead three days later. So getting the most out of Halloween. It's partly about realising that the best thing that we can do for our children and for ourselves is to be totally honest that evil exists. But equally, for us to be really clear that a much greater power exists in God's powerful and amazing love. The love that confronted evil at its fullest and defeated and disarmed it. That's the wonderful message that we have as Christians that we need to be proclaiming all of the time but particularly at Halloween, when we're in a culture so confused, realising somehow that something called evil exists, but making a very confused response to it. We can bring clarity by what we think, by what we say, and by how we act. We need God's help to enable us to do this. So let's pray.